Can you believe it's June already? It felt like winter was just around the corner. To celebrate the northern hemisphere tilting towards the sun, let's respond to a video regarding how evolution actually proves creation. Wow, who would have known? And you know, it obviously can't be fake news, right? Like, despite that everyone I respond to in this channel are, you know, wrong about things, this guy must obviously be correct. <laughs> no. So we're going to cover all the evolution arguments right here. We're going to be here for a long time then. Evolution is an entire field of science that has gone through a lot of testing, retesting, studying, experimenting, observing, and theorizing. If you're going to go through all the evidence and argumentation, then you better free up the next few years of your life. And not only that, the evolution, so-called evolution proofs will prove the opposite often. It will prove the Bible. God tried to prove to you that according to Romans chapter 1 verse 20, that it was by him everything is created. So this proves all of creation has something in common. It's a designer. Ah yes, the classic creation argumentation. All of life do indeed have things in common. For example, the method of creating energy. Protons being pumped across a membrane to generate a potential has been documented in even some of the earliest arising life forms. But of course, the list of similarities are different depending on which species you are comparing. And what we've noticed is that if organisms are further apart in terms of ancestry, they have more differences. Wow, who would have known? It's almost as if these similarities can be used to draw a map of some sort. You know, build an evolutionary tree perhaps. But if you wanted to, I suppose you could ignore the number and specifics of the differences and say that it was just due to a common creator. That's fine too. Now evolutionists, they would like to argue where they're going to use chimpanzees are 90% uh, similarity in DNA compared to humans. 99%, thank you very much, although that's actually not entirely true due to the fact that our chromosomes and genes don't entirely line up. Whatever, I don't know why I even responded to that part. But yeah, you can see that the more related a species is to another species, the more similar they are. And this doesn't just apply to humans. They're also going to take some kind of backbone structure from you where the, uh, the amount of numbers within your backbone perfectly match with some, some other animal, etc. So they're going to use basically any, bio, any organism in your body and they're going to see how it can match with an animal out there. Yes, these are homologous structures. They are important in our understanding on the field of evolution. It helps us draw conclusions, it helps us map out trees, and most importantly, it helps us better understand evolutionary direction in the past. Homologous structures was more of a way for us to draw the map, not prove evolution directly. There are more direct proofs that are used, such as DNA evidence or fossil evidence. You can argue this way. You can argue that, no, it doesn't, it doesn't prove a common ancestor, it proves a common designer. Amen. For example, if you see a Honda Accord and a Honda Civic, am I going to stupidly teach that, you know, this Honda Civic evolved from the Honda Accord. They both share the same ancestor somewhere. No. I'm not a fan of this type of argumentation. There are so many reasons to believe that all organisms came about through a common ancestor. For example, it's corroborated by multiple lines of evidence ranging from DNA, proteins, and fossils. But let's ignore that for a bit. Let's say evolution isn't true, just for the sake of argument. In that case, homologous structures still wouldn't prove a designer. It's a massive leap of faith to go from, hey, these structures look similar, to, wow, God created everything. And let's address your Honda argument. We know what cars are because we invented them. We've seen them being created and they are man-made objects. Humans made them. Plants and animals, on the other hand, have neither of those. We have never directly observed how they came about on Earth and we don't know anything about their origins. So then we would have to go by the evidence to tell us the whole story. These two things cannot be compared whatsoever. I find it funny that this argument is still being used. It's so old. Alright, here's another evolution argument is radiometric dating. Carbon-14 dating. The problem with radiometric dating, you got to realize this, it doesn't matter which dating method it is, whether it's potassium argon, carbon-14, or etc. There's a problem with these dating methods. So they can measure anything from their environment to give you an accurate date, that's fine. But the problem is this, what if the environment around this fossil changed? Yeah, that's good. Then it would change this fossil that you're dating, right? If you add more time, let's say thousands of years, do you have a lot of faith that this object is going to be left untouched? Do you have that much faith that the environment surrounding it will always remain the same? 
Before I answer your question, what makes you think that scientists haven't considered all of that? Science is about making accurate predictions and models. Do you really think these scientists who are experts on radiometric dating wouldn't have thought of the environment being potentially changed or different than expected? Who do you think these scientists are? They're considered experts for a reason, and there's no way they would have missed something like that when performing radiometric dating methods. Now that that's out of the way, let me answer your question. Yes, contamination is an issue that needs to be addressed, and there are multiple ways to combat this. Firstly, information about the rock or fossil being dated must be accumulated to to determine levels of alteration. Samples that have a sign of being tampered with obviously would not be used for dating, but that's not the only thing that is done. Another important step is to date multiple samples from the same location to corroborate one another. If we date many, many fossils or rocks of the same age and they all agree with each other, then you can say that contamination or alteration did not happen. Dating methods aren't often done independently. We not only date multiple samples to confirm accuracy, but they are also dated against other dating methods. Let's say carbon dating, for example. It is corroborated by tree ring dating as a way of calibration, so that we can confirm the carbon-14 to carbon and 12 ratio in the past. It's not like scientists are using only one dating method to determine the age of a sample. Especially when we're talking about thousands and millions of years, these methods need to agree with one another, and that eliminates the possibility of contamination or alteration of the environment. By the way, I don't really enjoy the fact that you're lumping all the radiometric dating methods together. Carbon dating, for example, is quite different compared to uranium lead, and the possibility of a changing environment is an entirely different concept. Look man, how many times have you touched something with just your fingertip? within just 10 years. And you have that much faith that this fossil was untouched for millions of years? Well, to be fair, fossils are buried by sediments, so, you know, not many animals are gonna get in there and make sure their fingerprints are on that thing. And then the, one of the strongest arguments is called the second law of thermodynamics. A fucking men, am I right, boys? Here's a toast to denying years and years of scientific research because it doesn't agree with my book. Second law of thermodynamics is entropy. In other words, in other words, when there's a certain object or organism out there, it don't, it doesn't, uh, it, it will break apart as time passes by. It doesn't improve in condition. It devolves, so to speak. It breaks apart. Yeah. If you leave a car running for, let's say, a hundred years, what's going to happen to the car? Gonna evolve into a Ferrari. No, it's gonna get worse. It's gonna turn into junk. Holy chicken nuggets! Your argument almost made sense! Except for the fact that, you know, that's not what the second law of thermodynamics is. It's funny because you briefly said it right earlier. Second law of thermodynamics is entropy. Yes, the second law of thermodynamics describes entropy. It states that things tend to move towards a net gain of entropy over time. In short terms, entropy is essentially the amount of unusable energy in a system. So the law essentially states that as time passes in an isolated system, entropy will increase in an attempt to reach thermodynamic equilibrium. It doesn't describe objects or organisms like what you claim. It doesn't say anything about how complex certain objects can be. I have a really old video that I made specifically addressing this claim on thermodynamics, so I highly suggest checking it out. Hopefully I remember to link it here somewhere. But anyway, objects that you utilize energy, such as living organisms, do not have their complexity limited by the second law of thermodynamics, because the law describes the availability of usable energy, not the mediums that hold this energy. Organisms can be as complex as they want, as long as the energy within them, assuming no transfer of energy to and from outside sources, doesn't increase over time. And as impossible as it is to measure that, we already know that that doesn't happen. To put this in an analogy, imagine a cup of water. The cup represents the organism, and the water represents usable energy. And to make it realistic, there's a hole in the bottom of the cup that slowly drains the water from that Cup. The second law of thermodynamics would state that this level of water would never increase over time, as long as there's no source of water flowing in. Water will continuously decrease. However, this cup can continue to evolve. Maybe it changes its shape into a bowl, and then a wine glass or something. The point is, even if the cup changes or transfers the water to another, better cup, as long as the total amount of water in the cup does not increase in volume, it abides by the second law of thermodynamics. Similarly, organisms can evolve and take on high complexity, but as long as the overall usable energy doesn't increase, assuming isolation, then it doesn't violate the law. I'm sorry, that's the best analogy I can think of, so if you still don't understand it, then go watch my video. That's second law of thermodynamics. Things break apart. See, when organisms come together, they always break apart more and more and more. I guess babies violate this law then. They don't seem to break apart as time passes. In fact, it's quite the opposite. See, that's the problem. All right, a, a third thing right here with evolution is that they believe concerning about macroevolution. Within macroevolution, there are two keys that they will always use. It's called mutation as well as natural selection. Now, you know what creationists believe? Creationists believe in microevolution. So for example, the easiest example is after Noah's flood, how did we get many different nationalities, right? Because we're all changing within our environment. 
Perfect. I thank you for bringing this up. One of the biggest problems with the story of Noah's Ark is that there isn't enough time. Pastor, you probably believe that natural selection and, quote, microevolution is enough to get from one family and diverge to all the races of people we have today. And I'm sorry to tell you that that's impossible. That would involve a tremendous rate of mutations higher than anything ever documented. It's physically not possible. What is it, 4,000 years? Or even 6,000 years isn't nearly enough. There's a reason when we talk about evolution, we say it happens over millions or billions of years. Because time is the solution to many of these problems. Natural selection is slow. Speciation is slow. Everything is slow. You cannot deny the changes that evolution can make to organisms over billions of years when you also believe that humans can apparently mutate fast enough to get from Noah's family to every single race we currently see in the world in such a short time span. It's hypocritical, to say the least. So all you have to do is ask an evolutionist, give me an example of macroevolution, and guess what? They will only give you evidence of microevolution. There's a few problems with you asking us to provide evidence of macroevolution. The type of evidence you guys look for are always something that has happened and that we can directly see with our own eyes. Since evolution on a larger scale happens over millions of years, that's not exactly something we can show you. Instead, we can show you fossils of what organisms used to be. For example, humans used to be more primitive versions of the Homo genus, such as Homo erectus. We could show you some fossils, but would you actually believe those are what humans used to be? Of course you wouldn't, because you're looking for a specific type of evidence that by concept alone does not exist. This is like you asking for an image of the physical surface of a black hole, which by what black holes are themselves, it isn't possible to provide that type of photo. For evolution, we can show you fossils of what organisms used to be, but you wouldn't believe it anyway. What else? Um, we can show you a current species that is undergoing speciation. Would that work? Because that certainly has happened with certain species of whales and can even be artificially done in laboratories. We need to sit down and have a good talk on what evidence is, because that's really the root of the problem when you guys ask us for evidence of macroevolution. Ugh, I feel dirty using that word. Macroevolution. Jesus. They can never give you an example of a dog changing into a cat. If you're going to think of this in terms of a modern species changing into another modern species, then I'm sorry to say that that's not what evolution states. Letters within a gene, it can, there can be things that can switch and it can be differentiated, but there's a certain pool and category that it cannot go beyond. It's going to have to remain the same information. Yeah, let's just make up a random barrier for DNA that is based on absolutely nothing. It's always wonderful arguing with creationists. They always repeat the same things they hear in their echo chambers, and it's just oh so wrong. I'm going to be ending the video here. Again, massive thank you to Fireshard, Shere Khan, and Elia for being the top patrons this month. I couldn't do this without you guys. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next week.